Good evening. My name is Renee Seidemann, and I'm a member of the Robin Nyman Mikva Education Fund Programming Committee of the Mikva Amuna Society of Greater Washington. We're very excited to be hosting a series of events this year with the support from the OU Women's Initiative. We have, were recently awarded an OU Women's Initiative 2022 Challenge Grant for Innovative Women's Programming. Our Women's Unity Series is entitled Engaging and Connecting Women in Our Community at All Ages and Stages of Life. Events from this past May through the coming December are targeted to different audiences while highlighting our shared commitment to community and family. In the chat, you can click on a link to a summary of all the events that have taken place or are upcoming. Our next event, this one in November, will be virtual as well, recognizing that it's easier for many of us to participate this way. Our final event will be an in-person celebration in Silver Spring, Maryland on Hanukkah. For those who didn't know her, Robin Nyman Aleha Shalom was the manager of the Wallerstein Mikva here in Silver Spring before her patira nearly three years ago. She was a renowned Mikva educator and a dynamic teacher and social worker who transformed the experience for women going to the Mikva throughout the country. With the blessing of the Nyman family, in 2020, the Mikva Amuna Society established the Robin Nyman Mikva Education Fund to honor her memory and perpetuate her legacy. The fund is dedicated to training mikvah attendants and greeters in our community and beyond, providing free Tarada Mishpacha and related educational programming, and sponsoring kala classes for Kalot in the greater Washington, D.C. community who are unable to pay for the classes. Since its inception, the Robin Nyman Mikvah Education Fund Committee has planned and presented eight programs on topics such as infertility, postpartum depression, pelvic health, Mikvah challenges, and how to talk about intimacy with your children, in addition to a local holiday. If you missed any of our past events, recordings are available on our website. Before we get started, here are some housekeeping items. We have placed all participants on mute. However, if you have any questions, you should put them in the chat as our panelists will be taking questions at the end of their presentations. The chat is set to be seen only by the host. Our speakers would very much appreciate if women put their cameras on, so if you're able to, please do so. We'll be putting a link to the post-event survey in the chat now so that you can fill out the survey at your convenience. We ask you to fill it out so that we can continue to make our events responsive to your interest and for a chance to win a $25 Amazon gift card. We'll repost the link later as well. This event was designed to appeal to women who are navigating motherhood, marriage, and Tarat HaMishpacha while raising teens and tweens. We're really privileged tonight to be joined by Laura Goldman, who will serve as moderator. After starting her professional career practicing banking and finance law, Laura shifted gears and is now a certified parent educator and professional coach. She trained and received supervision with the Coaches Training Institute, where she received her designation as a certified professional co-active coach. In addition to teaching parents and coaching, Laura is an active lay leader in our Silver Spring community. Beyond her involvement our local, in our local institutions, Laura also teaches a weekly Torah class for women. Laura is the parent of four children, ranging in age from middle school age to adulthood, and very excitingly, she is a new grandmother. Without further ado, Laura Goldman. It helps to become unmuted. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be in this uh, in this role this evening. Um, I am um, a uh, supporter, obviously, of the mikva and a community uh, leader. And it's a pleasure to finally be able to marry both my passions for communal leadership as well as um, some professional work that I do as a parent coach. Um, and so tonight, the evening, uh, there is this intersection of so many interests. There's raising teens and tweens, there's education, there's Taras Mishpacha, there are the communal roles. Um, and tonight we have the perfect women to uh, address these issues with us and discuss them. Two beloved communal leaders and educators, um, Chaya Volvovsky and Alana Pepper. 
Uh, so first, I'd like to just take a moment to introduce Chaya, although she probably needs no introduction here. Chaya is a wife and mother of children ranging from eight months to 17 years. And I have to say, I remember very distinctly that first one when they moved here. And her uh, and we've had the pleasure to know Chaya in a personal capacity, um, as well as the Rebetzin of the Chabad of Silver Spring. Um, Chaya is passionate about education. Uh, she runs a day school. She runs the um, Ganizi camp. She is uh, the Chabad preschool director. Um, and in her own words, she strives to learn about and live by the Hasidic philosophy and the teachings of Chabad and the Rebbe. So we are also pleased to be joined by Alana Pepper, who also a personality in the community in her own right. She is a wife and mother of three children, all in their teen years, which you should give her a vote for just for being able to do that. Um, Alana has been involved in formal and informal education for the past 20 years and has taught lower school children all the way through high school. She holds a graduate degree in counseling with a focus on marriage and family and is currently studying for her master's in social work. She's also a college teacher. So both Chai and Alana are very involved in communal work outside of their families and their formal job, jobs. So um, I want to pose uh, a series of questions. The way we'll run this tonight is I'm gonna pose a series of questions and help kind of navigate and direct the conversation a little bit. And um, I will leave it up to you unless you would like me to call on each one of you, I'm going to leave it up to you ladies to decide who'd like to take the answers to each question first. Um, you both are informal and formal educators and role models in Silver Spring and have been so for some time now. What do you each enjoy most about your roles in the community? Okay, I'm going to go first this time. Um, hey everyone, it is really, really great to be here with all of you. I am both honored and humbled to be part of this conversation. The topic of teens and tweens and marriage, for anyone who knows me very well, is very, very dear to my heart, both professionally and personally. Um, and I hope to share lessons and experiences from both teaching and as a parent and my continued um, education. Um, this question I'm really excited to answer before I go into it too much. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, when I was younger, I always wanted to be a policeman. Um, minus the taser and the gun, I think I am still very involved in that kind of job. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I love a little bit of crazy, a lot of fun, but I really love setting boundaries for kids to be successful in life. And I love helping them feel safe in their classroom and their environment and themselves. I kind of think of my job as like, if you think of the scene of the child who, you know, hacks into the FBI computers and instead of putting him in jail, they kind of like recruit him to be part of their team. I kind of feel like that's my job very often is that I look at children, I see what their strengths are, I see what they're good at, I see the amazing characteristics that Hashem gave them and try to guide them and gear them to um, use that um, for themselves and for the world around them. I moved here about nine years ago with my amazing husband and children um, from Phoenix, Arizona, to join the Berman Hebrew Academy, where I got to work for seven years in the incredible middle school with those amazing children. I am currently, um, last year and this year, working at Yeshiva of Greater Washington, the girls' high school, where I am currently working with that incredible um, teaching staff. Um, this question really gave me a chance to reflect on my time and involvement in the community is not something that I usually have the chance to do. Um, a couple um, years ago, well, not so many years ago, as we like to think during COVID, I was asked if I want to join the Mikvah and I was very humbled by the question. Um, and I joined the team, which was an incredible experience. I became a greeter and an attendant um, and has really made a very big difference in my life, especially as a college teacher. I feel like it really brings everything very much together. Um, and then a couple of years ago, I was asked, my husband and I both were asked to be, um, to join the high crisis intervention team, um, where my husband and I both feel very passionately that this is necessary, um, in our community. Um, and we both have masters in counseling, so we figured it was a good call. And it really, we really did it because when people are in their darkest moments and having their hardest time, it's an opportunity for us to help them really through that grief and through those darkest moments. Um, but all through these beautiful experiences, I really made me realize like I've had such an opportunity to inspire, but really be inspired by the children that I teach, 
by the singles and the couples that come through my house um, for guidance um, and really by learning from them. I learn about their midos. I learn about their connection to Hashem and how hard they work, each of them, on really working on becoming the very best person that they could be. So with all of this, with the mikvah and chai, it's really um, made me realize I'm so honored and privileged to be part of this Silver Spring community. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, what do you love about this role of yours in the community? Well, okay, it's hard to follow Alana. <laughs> one, one of the really nice things about, um, you know, being here tonight, even though this is a little bit against my nature, I'm not, you know, um, but uh, first of all, I, when Sarit asks you something, you always say yes, that's number one, <laughs> but it was such, it's so wonderful because I really got to know Lana and Julia and the whole team and I, I, I've been enjoying that. So a little bit about myself, um, you know, we moved here actually 18 years ago, it's going to be 18 years. And, um, I feel like what, what, what I like to do is take, and I, aspire to do is just take opportunities that come our way and, you know, be present in those opportunities um, with a strong emphasis on always thinking about how, when you're talking to another person, how they really are feeling and just to, to be there for them. Um, I also um, do get to learn with Kalas um, in many different interesting uh, situations that I had been lucky to, you know, be involved in. Um, Kalas maybe that are not connected um, in the community and are going for the you know one time before their wedding. Um, some kalas that their spouses went through a conversion, um, and we actually have one of those beautiful stories happening tomorrow right here in our community. So it's very exciting. So I feel like it's such a gift to be a, a part of people's lives, and I I feel like I just try to stay present and you know learn from each person. And just by small conversations and being there, I feel so, so, so many wonderful things come out of them. So I feel very lucky to be a part of this amazing community. And that's about it. Yeah. Thank you both so much for that. So now let's start to take like a little bit more of a dive into the topic tonight, which is teens and tweens and Tahara's Mishpacha. And in conversations uh, with this team and with me um, indirectly, uh, you guys talked a lot about how you don't start talking about Tahara Simshbacha in detail, obviously, with teens and tweens, but you do start setting a foundation at this age for them to be open to that mitzvah, receptive to it when it is the right time for it to be a part of their lives, please God. And so you start to model conversation perhaps. And I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how do you set that groundwork now at this age, even though they're perhaps a little bit too young, obviously, to understand the details of the mitzvah. Why don't you start? Go ahead, Chaya, lead off. Okay, so um, it's, that's a good question. and. It's, it, by the way, these questions gave me an opportunity to really think. So, <laughs> um, so like Laura said, you know, it's not about talking about the halachas of Taras and Mishpacha with children when they're young. But I feel with everything in life that role modeling is the best way to teach. So when you show your children that a marriage is very sacred and holy, and that is the foundation of the home, kids pick up on it. Um, and, and, and they... Kids, they want to see, you know, they, 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 they pick up respect when you're respectful to your spouse. I, I, I'm a strong believer that hypocrisy is what turns kids off in life. You know, it, they pick up on it. And we, we don't want to ever, um, when some, you know, sometimes when a child tells me about something that a teacher did, and I do feel it's hypocritical, I have to find a very careful way to, to say that I understand how you feel. And as a parent, that's something that it's constant work to, to practice what you preach. Something simple, simple as if you're telling them not to be on the screen, we can't be on our screen, you know? It's, you, you have to live it. Um, so I, I think by working on ourselves is really the best way to teach our children what we expect of them and what we want them to be. So really parenting is working on ourselves. I, I actually took, well, Laura, I know this is, this is a, something that's, you know, close to your heart parenting, but there was this course on parenting and it, 
the, the, the moderator start off by saying, if you're coming on a course for like quick tips and tricks, then you've got the wrong course. If you're coming on the course, you are coming to become a better person and then you can become a better parent. So that's just, you know, a lifelong work. Um, you know, there's, there's a great little joke of, um, that there's a shlomazel, a shlomil, and a nudnik, okay? The shlomazel spills the soup on the shlomil, and the nudnik wants to know what kind of soup it is, right? So what's the point? The point is that let's not miss the point. So when something happens in our home, we have to make every moment a teachable moment. So one of my little stories I like to share is that one morning, this was quite a few years ago, my son came down, it was the last day of Hanukkah and there was school that day. And he came out and said, where's my menorah project? And I thought it was over this whole project. And for those that know me, like I throw things out when I'm done with them. <laughs> so my heart like sunk. It was a Monday, you know, Monday is in town, it's garbage day, it was gone. And I had this moment that I had to make a decision what to do. And I was very embarrassed and I knew I, he worked hard on it. And I said, okay, I'm just gonna say the truth. And I said to my son, I'm so sorry, I, I threw it out. But you have a choice. The choice is you could be really mad at me and I respect that or we have a half an hour till school starts and I will dedicate this next half hour to help you make a new menorah. He was so nice to me. He <laughs> said, Let, I'll take your help. I wonder if he remembers the story. He's already <laughs> off in yeshiva. I'm gonna ask him next time he calls. <laughs> beautiful. That's the point beautiful. is that sometimes we have to, we have to, you know, be, we have to be real. We have to, not sometimes, all the time, but situations that we have to really, it, it, it sometimes could be humbling, humiliating, it could be hard, but I do think these messages is what, you know, those are the ones that stick. I can tell you a lot of stories that were not successful, but that was one that I felt, um, you know, and then just to conclude um, that there is the, there's a book called the Hayom Yom, it's written by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, a safer, and it's a little point for every day, like in a little snippet. It's, it's very nice, easy learning. And there's on one of the days, there's a young young that says that every day you should think for 30 minutes about each child. So I know what some of you are thinking, you're doing the math of how many hours of my day I'm thinking about each child. But I, I really I feel <laughs> as we get, especially as our children get older, we do think about them a lot. And the point of this little saying is that we, we have to put thought into our children because we, we are the ones ultimately that we were gifted with these precious neshamas and we, we, have, to, we have to work hard. And, and the more work we put in, we, we have to then daven Tashem that we should see the nachas that comes in. Mm -hmm. So that is my thought on how we raise our children, not that we're teaching them about, you know, Tarsim and Shabbat I We will get to the question of when they're older and, you know, what's appropriate. But just in general, the environment that, is important to set in our homes. Okay, beautiful. Alana, what do you have to add to that? From there, but that was like so powerful and so much to think about. Um, so I just want to put it out there, but when I'm talking about Taras HaMeshpacha, I'm not talking about the halachos involving mikvah. I'm really talking about conversations that's around, around sex and anatomy um, of what that is involved with. Um, I just want to put that out there to be very clear. I don't believe that Taras HaMeshpacha halachos should be taught um, to teens and tweens. I think a lot of things get confused and misinformation. So just throwing that out there. Um, I think that when we think of the long game of what we want for our children and how we want these conversations to happen when they're tweens and teens, I kind of think about how do we set that up when they're younger? Um, and I think that making a, a house that is a safe place for them, um, not just to play and to have fun, but a safe place for conversations and open conversations really sets the tone. Making sure that when questions are thrown out there, they're not ignored, whatever the question is. Saying something like, that's such a great question, let's find a time to answer it. Or maybe that's a great question, we can you know, maybe explore that a little later or answer it in a way that they could understand it. 
but never ignoring questions and making places that are safe places for, for kids to be able to talk. I think teaching the power and the beauty of our bodies to both boys and girls is going to give them that ability later, and we're going to talk about even later in life, but the ability later to have these conversations because they're setting a tone that this is normal, that talking about your body, talking about beauty, talking about how fantastic you are is something that is normal in this house. Um, parents expressing how beautiful their kids look. And I'm talking about fathers to daughters, mothers to sons, and not just talking, hugs, physical interaction sets that up. When a father says to a daughter, you look so beautiful in that dress, there, something else clicks differently than when a mother says it to a daughter. Or when a father or mother goes and hugs their son, my 19 year old all the time, I say to him, come give your mama a hug, come on. And he knows like, that's it. He has no choice, whatever he's doing. And he's 19. But these things, when they're very little, that cuddling, you want that closeness to continue later on. And it can only happen if both parents are involved in that interaction, are involved in that love, are involved in creating a safe space, especially in today's day and age. We want our children to have a place where these conversations can happen with us, not with their friends, not through TikTok, not through Netflix, not through Disney, but through us, that we are the ones who are laying that framework of what a marriage looks like, what a, an appropriate relationship looks like, um, the kadusha of it, the beauty of it, how fantastic and amazing this relationship can be. And that all comes from when they're younger and we're creating these, um, these situations for them. As kids get older and as they go from like these little kids that are like trying to get your attention and are so excited to hang out with you and so excited for you to be proud of them, they still are like that when they're tweens and teens. They just, just looks a little bit different. They go from being dependent to wanting independence. And their opinions might be very different from ours. And that changing relationship, we have to shift with them. We have to be able to say, oh, I hear your opinion and validate it, even if it sounds totally crazy, which happens sometimes with teens. I mean, only sometimes with teens. But when it happens to be able to validate them and to be able to, you know, um, have that conversation and to love them. And all of that comes really from a foundation from when they're younger and making them feel safe and making them feel um, loved. So that's, that's so I want I want to kind of pick up on that theme of of modeling healthy, uh, a healthy relationship. Each of you spoke about that in your own way. Chaya, you spoke about the Kedusha in marriage and modeling Kedusha and respect in marriage. And Alana, you talked about what it looks like to model a healthy relationship um, and, and uh, between the sexes. And, you know, my, I, I used to say, or somebody said it to me once, and it's, and it's true, your children should know um, that you go to, to go, that you go to mikvah, but not when you go to mikvah. Um, and so when, when we talk about the context of healthy relationships and, and, a, and a, a relationship based in Kedusha, how do you establish in, in your marriages and how would you advise those of us listening about how to, to model that with some more particularity within the home? So that the children kind of understand that the Taras Meshbacha is an aspect of it, even though they don't know really what that is. Like what, what is the foundation for that? This one? Okay, I'll go with this one first because this is like my passion. I mean, all of this makes me excited, but I um, find, and I think we both feel so strongly about this, that um, the main thing in our entire lives, more important than everything else is our spouse. Our husbands are our number one focus. Um, obviously, children are very important too, but children are, are kind of like a phase. They come, they're in the house, and then they go on to their own lives. But that marriage kind of stays, right? And you want to be able, after 20 years or 30 years, when those kids leave, and please God, you still have many, many more years of marriage, all of you, um, that relationship that you have built up with your spouse is super strong and super powerful. And that happens when you guys stick together as a team, you guys work together, and it's important for the children to see that because it influences them. It influences what they want later for their marriage, what they want later for their Taras and Mishpacha, for this whole piece. Um, I think it's really important, really, really, I cannot stress how important it is for there to be love, 
Kids see love between a husband and wife. They see touch in the house, whatever minimal it is and whatever, you know, people feel comfortable. But there has to be something that people know that this is a part of what happens, that we can have fun. You know, fun is like such a, a word sometimes I feel like it is taboo, but like so much fun, that life should be so much fun with a spouse. And that there's difficult situations. There are really hard challenges that happen in life. I remember being younger and my parents sometimes would have to be really difficult um, conversations having 10 crazy children if you guys know me and there were nine others like me there were times where they had difficult, call, right? you <laughs> <laughs> difficult conversations but I would always 20 minutes later hear laughing like hysterical laughing every single time and that was kind of a model for me that like there can be difficult times there are times we have to have really serious conversation raising teens and tweens is not easy but that there should be a lot of fun involved in that marriage um it's important to discuss that and show that it's not just a mitzvah with rigid rules, right? It's not like you have to do this and this and this, but it's a beautiful, amazing, incredible relationship. And it is the most meaningful relationship that you're gonna have um, in your life. And that for me, I model that I love my marriage. My husband's actually boyfriend of my phone. All my kids know it, my students, a lot of them know it too. And they're like, what is wrong with you? I'm like, there's a lot. But, <laughs> but boyfriend and my bow, and it's just fun for me. You know, marriage feels like really old, even though I'm getting there. Um, but I love my marriage. My kids know it. Um, I have fun with my marriage. And my kids know that there's work that goes into marriage, but it's all worth it. And I really enjoy it. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow, Lana. You are a lot of fun. Okay. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, so... So Laura phrased the question like in a way like the, the bottom line is like, we want the kids to see that and they and like I said before they pick up on it. Um, I, I believe kids pick up when there's respect and love in a marriage when it's real, right? When it's when it's deep, when it's there. Um, you know the pasuk hine matov umanaim. So hine matov, what is good and what is pleasant. Shevet achim gam yachai when we are together. So the word tov is good and na'im is pleasant. So it's interesting that why does it have to say what's good and pleasant? Because not always what's good is pleasant, right? And I'm sure everyone can think in their minds of a time that it was good, but it wasn't pleasant. So in a marriage, we have to really tune into the interests of each other. So, you know, I'm sure my husband did a lot of things for me that he never thought you know, thought was good or you know, or pleasant, I don't know. But he, when you tune into your spouse and do what is of interest to them, that, that creates a stronger bond. Um, another thing is the idea of ahava and kavod. I wanna just touch upon that. So what's the idea of love? So for those that like gematria, gematria, just, I, I always love gematria. So I, I have the gematria of ahava, if you do quick math, is 13. The same word, that um, the same numerical value is echad, one. So what's love when you're one with someone? Because when you're one with someone, you love them. So you're gonna do anything for them, even if it's you know, something that you thought you would never do. What's kavod, what's respect? You respect another person because usually they have something that you don't have, right? So in a marriage, it's usually something that you don't have that your spouse brings to the marriage that makes it a, you know, it, it, it strengthens the marriage. So actually I was at a chuppah last week. My brother-in-law got married. And um, so this was on my mind at chuppah because the rabbi that officiated the chuppah was actually my brother-in-law. And he said so many beautiful things. One thing he said is that when um, his father said, told him that there was once a chassin that after he got married, came to him and said, we, it says in a pasuk, I don't know the, the source of it, chasen doma lamelech, a groom is compared to a king. And he asked the, the, uh, my brother-in-law's father, what, how long is this going to last for? You know, like the chasen is the king and the kala is the queen. So the, his father answered him, as long as, as you treat your wife like a queen, you are a king. And it's funny because just today I was in my house and someone came in, someone that was newly married. And I turned to him, I said, so how are you? Chassin, I refer to him as Chassin. 
he's like, for how long are you going to call me Hassan? And I told him this thing. So I like that. So <laughs> it was, it was really, um, and this was, came from a very wise, a wise person. And I think that it's, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be over after one year. This should be for, for a lifetime. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. beautiful, really. So, so beautiful. So the foundation that we begin for any conversation about Taras Mishpacha at any level, at any stage, starts with the foundation of the marriage, right? That there's a loving relationship between the spouses that the kids can intuit because at the youngest ages, that's what they are. They're intuitive, right? And that's what they're going on. So now let's talk about as they get a little bit older and the developmental stages change, begin to change. First, we've got our tweens, you know, up through what, like 10, 11, 12-ish. And then our teens, our young teens, 13, all the way through our 18-year-olds. And that's a wide range. There's a lot of development that happens in those in that second stage. So more specifically, what kind of developmental milestones are you looking for in your children? And, and remember, your children are both sons and daughters, so there may be some gender difference here. Uh, both in terms of the stage as well as the way that that's addressed. And what do you reveal with respect to this mitzvah at each stage? Who would like to begin? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So it's a little bit of a loaded question. I'm going to try and answer all your points. Um, I think some of them are longer. Each, some of them can each be their own class in itself. Um, but we're going to do our best to answer it, to give everyone um, a little bit to walk away from. Um, so I think the first one is them, like I said before, because I'm, I think this is um, a very powerful thing, but understanding the power of their body and the power of their beauty is kind of different through every single stage. And as a foundation, understanding that Torah and mitzvahs really guide us to the most unbelievable and incredible life possible. And really that needs to go along with the stages and with whatever you're teaching at that time is that Torah and mitzvahs are there to give you the most incredible life possible. So any mitzvah that we're going to teach along with this or anything, um, it's there for success. And I think that's really a foundation that I, I find very powerful. Um, and really each child is different. So for one kid, it could be way earlier. Um, the con they might bring up the conversation. Like for instance, um, when I was in fifth grade, um, I remember where I was, I was in the stairwell and one of my friends said to me, go start talking about sex. And I was like, I was in fifth grade. Okay. I was like a little picture. I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. So what did I do? I went home. It's Friday night. My dad's like, you know, ladling out the soup. And I look at my mom and go, what's sex? And she's like, okay. And she takes me in the head and we go upstairs and she actually sat down and explained it to me. And I was like, uh, -uh you guys don't do that. That's just disgusting. <laughs> but it opened up for me an ability to be able to have that conversation later. So once I already opened up that conversation to my parents, my parents were like, okay, let's, you know, let's get it over with and let's start it now. And I was the oldest. So, you know, why not? It's so fun. Um, so I really believe that different stages um, and different kids, and also it depends also if the conversation comes up or if the conversation is something that has to be brought up. So again, when they're younger, allowing that conversation, any conversation to be open allows the ability for them to come in and to have that conversation. But if it doesn't come up naturally, I believe at different stages there are different parts, talking about your body, talking about the changes, talking about development um, is really important. Um, for instance, when a girl gets her period, it doesn't mean that it's a time to have a full-fledged conversation, but it does mean it should be quietly celebrated. There are many girls who have told me that the reaction is, ew, gross, you have your period, and it is crucial for us as moms and dads, and dads, um, to quietly celebrate this moment with their daughter and to realize that this is the beginning of your body changing, and it is a beautiful gift. Um, so that is an example of something that I really believe is quite a powerful moment. Again, you don't have to go into everything if your child is nine, right? Because children get their periods earlier. But it does mean that it allows this conversation to start and to talk about your body. And maybe she has questions about it and maybe she wants to understand. Um, and really depending on um, what age they are. Um, I'm also a big believer that if your kid is going to sleepaway camp and you need to know your kid and you need to know the sleepaway camp, that these are conversations that you have to have. They are going to happen in camp. There are kids who come in with a lot more information than you want your child to ever know until they're getting married, but they come in with that information and you want to be the one who gives it to your child. You don't want to be the one who hears about it after they get home from camp or God forbid not hear about it at all. So you really, that is also something that I believe strongly about. Um, I always tell my kids that when they have questions to come back, 
it doesn't mean that when they have questions it has to be at the dinner table when they come back and that everyone all of a sudden has to know these exciting details and what they have questions about we do things private in our house um everything is very open in my house um my husband works at Berman and is a guidance counselor and I for Shiva. So there are all kinds of conversations that happen as a guidance counselor um, and we're very, very open. But when it comes to this topic specifically, it is something that they can come to me at any time and my husband and I will make time and have a private conversation. But they should always come back with questions. Again, in the society that we live in, it is very important to keep that open. As far as sons versus daughters go, um, sons is a whole class in itself. I really believe raising boys to be Jewish men is a whole entire class um, in itself um, and really needs a lot of attention because it's very different than girls. Um, but again, it depends on the maturity. Um, and I don't, I do believe in telling them uh, everything that's going to happen and, you know, at different stages, but I don't believe in telling boys about how girls are through puberty and girls how boys are through puberty. As much as I am open um, and have a lot of conversations, I believe that it's distracting. And I also believe that, like, we want to teach our kids that there's a privacy to this. There's a beauty, but there's a privacy and to respect their bodies and they need to be respectful of other people's bodies and the puberty that they're going through. So even though I do have conversations, I, I don't at the right time, they're going to know they will see. But I don't believe that as tweens and teens that they need to understand how the opposite gender is um, experiencing it. I believe it's distracting. Um, I do believe, at least in my house, um, both parents are there for a lot of these conversations. Um, I think that it extends the ability to understand that Taras and Mishpacha is something that is beautiful and that both parents are involved in, and not that it, there's anything shameful about it. Um, that a dad can't talk to a daughter about it, or you know, a mom can't talk to a son about it, because like, oh my gosh, whatever. Um, but if these things are set up when they're younger, then it's not really as awkward of a conversation. If it's all of a sudden like, okay, we need to talk, and we've never had conversations before, it's going to be uncomfortable and awkward, and you know what, that's okay. And there's going to might be giggling, and that's okay. It's a normal reaction to an uncomfortable situation. And you can say that this is all normal, right? Like this is all okay and making them feel comfortable and making them feel safe in that space. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important that these conversations happening according to the child and their stage. And, and before, wait, before Chaya takes, uh, takes the question, I just want to follow up with one. At what stage, uh, so you were spoke, speaking mostly of daughters, although of sons as well, we're talking about all the way through 17, 18, you know, juniors and seniors in high school. Does it shift at that point for you? So I think 17 and 18. So I'll tell you, like, it really depends on what your child comes home with. So I do, I believe in talking about sex. I believe in talking about, there is so much out there. They're going to come home. If you opened it up, they're going to come home with LGBTQ questions. They're going to come home with everything that they've seen and everything that's out there. And that's okay. You want them to come home and you want it to be a discussion. Um, when my, when my, you know, my daughter one time asked me a question about halacha, about Nida, I said, we can talk about it and understand that the rest of the halacha you'll learn later. Um, I'm very clear about the fact that I'm very open, but I believe that there's a beauty to learning it when you need to. Otherwise, I feel like there's so much misinformation about a mitzvah that is so delicate and cautious. Does that answer your question? Yes. In other words, if they come home and are ready to have that conversation, and in particular, I'm sure that all of us have dealt with situations where we have teens who are fully awake and fully aware, and we go to mikvah. Right. Or on a Friday night, we go to mikvah, or for those of us who are mikvah attendants, even who are going to be of service, right, to women who are going to mikvah, that at a certain age, kids start to realize that you're not there. Okay. So I think, I think that uh, addressing that specific point, which I think is really important, um, I think that helping kids when they're younger really understand boundaries and privacy is crucial. My kids know I leave the house all the time. And my daughter one time said to me, have fun. And then she said, oh, I'm so sorry. I hope, I wish you had with whatever you're doing. Because I could be going to do the mikvah. I could be going to a high crisis moment. I could be going out, you know, to Starbucks with someone random. But it, I've set a premises to an extent that there's privacy in the home. They might know that there's mikvah. And, you know, those are things that come up as they get older. They're learning about it. But there is no discussion about, you know, me going to the mikvah. I talk about, you know, self-care. And I talk about, you know, I give you time. I give my husband time. And I give myself time. So if there's a bath running, there's no discussion about it. I'm, I have self-care. This is what I need right now for myself. So, hi, what are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, we discussed this on yeah. our phone calls. So first of all, my, my mother has a great line. She's like, it's really good to be open-minded, 
but not too open-minded that your mind falls out. And I feel like, especially in today's day and age, that and, and we are open-minded people. And especially with the lifestyle we live, is having a Chabad house. And we have all kinds of different people in our lives. And, and our, our children know that. And one, one, one you know, I, I feel like it's very important to, to speak to them about that, that, you know, I, I had children very young come back and say that, you know, that person looks like a boy or looks like a, are they a, is he a boy, is she a girl, you know, and we, and we have discussions. These are conversations that are coming up in today's day and age, and we have to know how to answer them. That's, like you say, a separate conversation. But what, what a lot of my discuss is that there has to be also boundaries. So you have to be open-minded, but you have to have boundaries. And I think it's really important to teach boundaries. So like, for example, like I want to say, when I leave at night, I do not tell my children where I'm going. Where are you going? I have to take care of something. No, I may have to go to Target. I may have to go for a meeting. I may have to do whatever it is. Children need to know that you don't have to ask a parent where you're going. Like there's certain boundaries. Like another thing like we lock our bedroom door at night it's locked they're, they're, they need to know that there's a, there's something Same. like that <laughs> so like i think the more that you set those boundaries and expectations with the child with your children they they respect it so in terms of when i speak to my children about different things sleepaway camp is definitely a time i'd sit down and speak with my children for many reasons but <laughs> it's a great opportunity so it's again just taking the opportunity to you know, the questions that come up, you know, there's so many questions that come up. So if, but we have to be present to hear the questions, you know, my daughter once did, she said, oh, you weren't listening, mommy. Cause I said yes to something that I shouldn't have said yes to. <laughs> I said, you're right, you're right. I was distracted and that's wrong. So the more present we are with our children they will come and ask us the questions. And every time they ask me a question that's like takes me back, like, like I stopped for a second. I'm like, I'm so glad they came to me, like, and not to someone else. Yeah. So I think as, if they know that we are open-minded, but we have boundaries, then it's, it's a healthy, you know, sort of medium that we want to create a balance that we want to create it in our homes. So, so Chaya, also for you then, then when your children come to you at various ages and ask you questions about either sexuality or their bodies or perhaps mitzvahs related to relationship, that that is something you also on a case by case basis feel out. Have you ever had um, opportunity or do you have a position on how you address that with your girls versus your boys? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really good question. Boys don't share as much as girls. So when I speak with my boys, I don't get as much feedback, you know, so it's I think you have to just keep the you have to speak openly to them and keep keep the conversation open you know, and some kids will come back to you more than others. It's, it's so much about personality. Um, but again, just finding, finding opportunities and to, to, that they should know that, that we're there for them and that it's okay to ask questions. And, and, and like you said, sometimes it's uncomfortable. It's okay to be, it's good to be uncomfortable sometimes. I think it's a sign of like refinement and sneers to, to be uncomfortable sometimes. And Yes. Oh, oh, I think I, I, I wrote some notes on this, you know, like this couple that was driving. I, I read this article and um, as they were driving, you know, the children in the back saw, you know, like a very, you know, romantic scene that shouldn't be displayed on the streets. And they were like, oh, and that's so gross. And and one of the parents so in the, art, the article is written really well. I, I can send a link to the article. And, and the, one of the parents took it as a teachable moment. And the parents said, it's not, it, that's, that's not gross. That, that's, it's just not the right place for it. So I think that's very important that there's a time and place and some things are meant to be private. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that things should be private because mm -hmm. then it's holy, you know, think about Torah is an Aaron Kodesh, a mezuzah is in a mezuzah case. Some things in life are meant to be private, but we live in a world that we're, everything's on social media and, and we're very into, you know, like open mics and things like that. But I, I think we have to always find that balance. It's a hard balance. 
One last question that we didn't really discuss. I'm going to throw call an audible here for both of you, um, for those who get the football reference. Um, and that is, <laughs> don't worry, Chai, I'm going to be easy on this one. Um, one thing that we didn't discuss, and we are talking to the two of you as the mothers in the home, but we didn't discuss at all the father's roles in these kinds of discussions to the extent that there is one or if that's discussed as part of the marriage and part of the parenting, if you could each speak to that for a brief moment. Yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I believe that it's hand in hand. Um, I believe that, like I said, as the marriage is the priority, that really nothing can get done properly or effectively, especially when you're talking about this mitzvah without your spouse. Um, our conversations almost always happen together. Um, because I really believe that the both children need to hear from both parents that this is not shameful, that this is beautiful, and this is something that we stand together. Um, and there are times where they might come to me because I'm the one who's available, or might go to you know my husband because he's available. But um, even things like simple as period, I believe it's very important for the husband to be able to say the word, like I you know, and to be able to have a conversation with with their daughter about it. How are you feeling? You know, I know you're having cramps. What's going on? Simple as that, but um, I, in my house, everything is hand in hand. Everything is done together. We have uh, numerous conversations, endless nights, endless tears, endless fila to say the right words, to say the right things, to bounce off each other, to make sure we're saying the right words, sending the right messages. But in my house, and I know it's the same with Haya, like everything is is hand in hand. Like this is how we live our lives with our spouses to help our children. Um, so everything is really done together. Um, the fathers in the house, like I said before, it's crucial that the girls have these positive interactions. Um, I always tell people if they're not getting it from their dads, they're going to get it elsewhere. Um, and same with the boys. There has to be that joint effort together. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And But it comes up in different ways. Like yes. some kids, girls sometimes naturally are more comfortable with the mother, you know, and boys are with the father. And and I think that's fine. But I, I you know, sometimes, you know, kids you know, want something, they go ask the mother and they ask the father. And I always say the answer, like, if you already asked Tati about that, then <laughs> we always agree. And they're like, really? I'm like, yes, yes. really. We, we really always agree. Now, if, if sometimes we do agree to disagree, but, <laughs> but we really do always agree. And when kids see that, then they're more comfortable. So my goal and, and our goal as parents is that they should know that if they have anything that bothers them, we will never be angry with them. We will never be, I mean, there are times maybe we're disappointed with our children's choices, but they know that we are always there for them to discuss anything that comes up. And it's a hard world out there because everything's on the tip of their fingers. You know, just the other day I had a discussion with my daughter. She learns out of town this year. And we were she talking about, her. I know, hold she on to your kids. They, 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 they move quickly. So we were discussing about phones, about, you know, there's some rules in different schools. If you have to put a filter on your phone that, you know, to, and, and, and her school didn't have, doesn't have this rule. So we were just discussing it. And, and she said, when I feel you trust me, then I do better. And, and I, and I said, thank you for expressing this to me. I do trust you, but in life, we always have to protect ourselves. So, you know, and not this whole discussion, but I was so happy that she was able to verbalize that I want you to trust me. Okay, beautiful. Well, I trust them. So I want to kind of draw this because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, and Julie is going to handle the questions. Uh, but I wanted to just kind of draw this together and tie it up with a bow if we could by asking you both to express what your wish is for your children as they're raised to this mitzvah of Taharas Mishbacha, please God, one day. What is your wish for them? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. so this is actually something that I feel very, very passionate about. Um, dealing with kalas, dealing with people at the mikvah, dealing with young girls, um, dealing, I taught kindergarten, really everything together is one of my, I have three really, three, but my biggest one is that on the wedding night, a girl, all of our girls know how beautiful and precious and amazing they are. 
and that Hashem has given them this gift of physicality that is like nothing else in the world with the right person. And they're excited to experience it and they're joyful and they are ready for it. And it is not something that God forbid is fearful and that is something they're nervous about, um, but that is something that they are excited about that we have trained them and we have taught them about how special and precious and beautiful they are and how powerful this is. So that's number one. Number two, and I'm going to do go quick so you can go. Yeah, Number two is um, Sneas, is that we teach our children that they are princesses. Um, I'm very into this. I call all my students princesses because I really believe it very strongly. And they're princesses both inside and outside. Um, and that we are not covering up to protect ourselves so the world doesn't see. But anything we're doing is to let our inner shine and our outer shine. And I teach that we should be attractive not attracting, right? We have to feel beautiful. We have to feel amazing. We have to go out like you every single day who's so beautiful and looks amazing, <laughs> right? And then we have to feel that and we have to, we have to teach our girls this. We have to let them know that this is something that is really, really, really important. And it, for ourselves is how are we going to teach this? And this is our, my wish for everyone is how are we going to teach this? And we don't, feel beautiful and we don't look beautiful for ourselves and for our husbands if we go out and we are looking dressed down or drabby or like i love sweaters but like in huge oversized sweaters we're like and we're never putting on real clothes and how are we going to teach our daughters to be beautiful for themselves and their husbands so that's my other wish is that we all have the capability of knowing our beauty and really passing on that beauty and teaching our children to have confidence, to be beautiful, and to know and understand how powerful and precious this gift of Taras HaMashbacha is. Wow, that was really beautiful, Lana. So I'm um, taking everything you say, I echo everything you say, every single thing you say, I 100% agree with, and it's something that's really, really important. And again, through mo role modeling that, they pick up on that. So, you know, like, it's interesting, because I think our, my parents, the generation of my parents, they didn't, they didn't sit down and lecture us like this is what I expect of you. You know what I'm saying? We, they, they role modeled it. But today we're we speak a lot more to our children, which I think is great. But we can't. Speak. I don't know if our kids always think it's so great, right. But it's okay. <laughs> okay, we'll ask them. But I think we have to do both. We have to role model, and we have to, you know. And as they get older, I find myself really thinking through what I'm doing more and more, like because I know they're watching carefully. You know, um, so yeah. my wish for, for my children is everything Alana said. One more point I wanted to make is that we have to make Yiddishkeit and our relationship with our spouses and our families positive because they hold on to positivity. Yeah. And like in whatever situation, Yom is coming up now, do we want our children to remember a stressed home or do you want a beautiful home? And, I, and every year I, I, I think about more things I can cut out of my Rosh Hashanah, let's say prep, and to be more focused how my children feel. Focus on them having something new for them to focus, right? Like Love focus it. on the extra dish you make, you're gonna end up throwing out after Rosh Hashanah, I'm just telling you. Facts. Like, <laughs> Such facts. You, you should really just, we want them to feel good about themselves. And and for yourself too, buy yourself something new for Yom Tif also. So in everything in Yiddishkeit, everything in your home should, should be with a positive twist so that they take that as they get older and that they love coming home and they will mm -hmm. feel comfortable to come to their parents Hopefully, oh, and yeah. you know, God willing, with good things. But if there are challenges, that they know we're there for them. So, so it it sounds if I can like wrap it up because I know it's getting late, and I'm sure there are questions because this is a very important topic. So I, I just want to in in brief sum up that the the messages of kedusha and this last message of each of you guys spoke of this in a slightly different way but it was very powerful they're serving Hashem with joy and and from a psychological point of view when kids code things with emotion they remember it right and we don't want them coding things with negative emotion shame embarrassment awkwardness we want them coding it especially a mitzvah as beautiful and as critical to the foundation of the home as this one we want them always to be coding relationship, their bodies, 
their their way of looking at Yiddishkeit and Torah as that guiding force. We want them to look at that with the beauty of Simcha so that they can remember it and live into it as they grow. So with that, I'm going to turn it over um, back to Julia to uh, to moderate questions. Julia, uh, thank you all for the opportunity. This was surprise. I'm here as well. I'm sure that you're in the thing. Yeah. Um, Hi, everybody. I am Julia, and I'll be, I'll be helping moderate the audience Q&A. I want to thank Laura for moderating this panel so seamlessly and for sharing her thoughts um, at really at great points. Um, I also want to thank our panelists for sharing so much of their wisdom and experience with us. Uh, we're grateful that our speakers have also agreed to take some questions from the audience that came in on the chat. But first, we're going to be putting a link in the chat in case you would like to make a contribution in support of tonight's program or future events like it. Uh, the link is going to take you to our mikvahs website. Uh, where you can uh, make a contribution to our education fund. We're also going to repost the survey link in our chat right now. Um, you can continue to post questions in the chat and we're gonna do our best to get to as many of the questions as we can. So let's get to it and let's see your questions. Um, we're gonna start with this question. So this conversation is discussing sexuality all in the context of married homes. Many of us have had to discuss sexuality with our children without a father at home. Do you have any guidance for how we can deal with this? <laughs> um, I think it's very much the same. Um, I think that children are very aware of situations that we are experiencing and being honest and open about that situation is okay. Um, and sitting with daughter, son, either one, and saying, I know this might be funny to have this conversation right now, but we're going to have it and it's important to have. We still want them getting the information from us, even if it doesn't feel the most comfortable um, to us. So whether the father's home, it could be even with fathers who are away on trips or aren't very home very often. Um, and that's OK. You know, bringing them in whenever we can is helpful. Um, or even having, you know, if a husband's away and comes home and wants to just say quickly, I know you had a conversation with mom. I'm really happy you had that. Let me know if you have any questions. It could be something as simple like that. Um, but even if a mom, it's just a mom saying, I know this, this might be an uncomfortable conversation. It might seem a little funny to you that I'm having it, but I really want to have this with you. And I love you. And I want you to be able to talk to me because this is a really important topic. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. So now we're gonna head to the next one. Um, this is a little bit of a longer one. Uh, growing up, my parents were so serious all the time with each other and I didn't see much joy between them or ever really having fun. Then my college teacher spoke a lot about the seriousness of Taras and Mishpacha, which is of course necessary, but she didn't convey the joy and happiness of it. I would like to show my kids that as adults, my husband and I can have fun, but also don't wanna to be too demonstrative. Alana, you mentioned fun, but can either of you give us some practical tips to create that healthy balance? Okay, um, it's, it's, it's a great question. I feel like it's hard to shift when you grow up with something a certain way or you learn something a certain way. And that's why I so strongly feel that teaching children from when they're young certain things that help, you know, keeping a home positive and beautiful and happy and you know, it is very important. And, and this person that's asking the question seems like she wants that in her home. So it's, it's a lot of work and you have to, it's work. Creating a happy home is a lot of work. And, um, and, and I discuss that with my children. Like, you know, if a child in the morning just doesn't want to, you know, you have the kids that don't want to get up in the morning to go to school. And I say, you know, in life, sometimes it's hard to get out of bed and to see something bright, but you have to find something joyful in your day. And I say, you know, there are days that are hard for me too. We have to, we have to be a little vulnerable with our children. Um, I, I, music is a big thing. I mean, I, I really love music. Putting music on in the home is a, is a great way to bring it in. And, and, and laughing at home is good. You know, like oh, one time I was having like, you know, a Zoom with my, I, I have quite a few sisters. And when I talk to them, I laugh a lot. And, and I think it's great for the kids to, to see that we laugh. Or like, you know, sometimes, you know, my husband and I will laugh about something and like, I think it's great. And I, I love when my kids laugh, yes. you know, I love when they giggle. Um, so it's work. 
and you have to bring the simcha into your home. I'm a big believer in that. Thanks. I agree. Yeah. So, finding different ways to do that is really important, whether it's at a dinner table or sitting on a couch together, finding fun questions to ask at dinner. There's loads of questions you could order on Amazon. You know, what's our favorite vacation? Or if you were to be a superhero, what would it be? And just engaging in fun things with each other, reading comic books, um, but finding fun things to do as a family, or even just let them see you guys even reading a couch, reading on the couch together, something that, that shows that you guys are doing things together in like a chill, fun way, really. And with your own personality, figure it out together, talk it out with him and say, this is really what I want. How can we do this together? How can we bring this more to light for our children? I also, I want to just touch on the question someone asked me if there's a father not in, in the home or whether, you know, if someone lost a parent or if it's a divorced home, whatever it is. I, I think that as a community, it's very important that, that we, we look out for each other and that we also, mm -hmm. if our children ask us questions about other families, if there's, you know, you know, you know, if there's a father, if there's not a mother or not a mother, anything like that. I think it's our job as a community to make make other families feel like part of our family. And that's something that it, it's, you know, it's a great time before Yemtif to reach out to families and say like, well, please join us. And um, and it's it's a win-win. Everyone enjoys each other's company and it, it always adds to the Yemtif. That's great. Thank you, both of you. Um, so another question that we have, which is a very practical question, is what do you recommend explaining to younger children, tweens or younger, when they notice uh, that you're sleeping in separate beds sometimes and together sometimes? So I actually always have my door closed. Same. My kids are not allowed in my room um, from the six months age and on. Um, my home is, my bedroom is my space to be me and to be calm. And if I'm having a hard moment and I want to go talk to my husband because I had a crazy day and I just need 30 seconds and just with him to feel normal again, that's where I go with my door closed. So my kids actually don't see. Um, that's my personally. Um, and if they were to see and they were discussed, I would just say, especially if they're younger, it doesn't, again, boundaries and privacy doesn't have to be always a conversation. But for me personally, my door is closed. Um, it's my, my, my holy space. Yeah, it is the holiest space in the home. So yes, I, I, I recommend locking the doors. That's great, <laughs> thanks for you. Um, so we have another great question in. Uh, what if you don't feel equipped to have the conversation or answer some of the questions from your kids? Are there any books that you, that either of you know of that could be recommended to parents to help with the framework of answering some of those difficult questions or designing some of those conversations? So I, I don't know of any. Um, when my kids were younger, there was much less out. You know, like I watched people with their baby carriages and I'm like, whoa, they have so much out today. When my kids were younger, I have a 19 year old, there wasn't as much available. Laura, do you have anything to add to that? I feel like you might have that one. You know, your if you're talking about books on sexuality there, you know, Yocheva Dubo wrote a book on how to talk to your kids about, um, you know, about sexuality and, and development. So you could read that as, uh, I think I have it here. I'll just look in a second um, and then I'll share it in the chat. Um, but there are no children's books that are written. Again, I, I think that the question about the foundation, again, about what kids need to know at the foundational level really has much more to do with what they see in the parents' relationship than anything else. Um, but maybe that's a book that's worth writing, ladies. <laughs> Good call. Thank I you. Think there may be a book. Yeah, maybe we, it's something we can share. Yeah, we can do some we'll research on that. Yeah, right. maybe do some research on that. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question. Physical touch in front of kids. What's the proper way to go about it? Thoughts, ladies. Um, we may have different opinions. Yeah, I think we have different <laughs> opinions. There are people who actually believe that there shouldn't be any touch. And again, I, I one thing I teach my kids is to respect everyone else's opinions. Um, I, for me personally in the home, I believe it is really, really important, um, to see, even if it's just like a touch, a tap, um, even a hug. I personally, you know, again, with my kids only in my household, um, I think that there's a certain love that's portrayed differently with a physical touch. But, um, again, it is extremely, um, according to you, 
and what you feel comfortable with. And even more so important to teach our children that we respect everyone else. That, you know, I, I recently saw grandparents walking down an aisle just next to each other. And I turned to my husband and I said, one day when like, we're like 150 years old and we're walking our great grandchildren down, I'm totally holding your hand. And the answer was, amen. You know, please God, <laughs> you know, it will happen. But like, that's me. That's what I saw. I saw like two people standing very stoic, but you know, but being respectful of the fact that that's how they, they live their life. And that's totally okay. I and mean, we all have to do what's comfortable within the, you know, that, that realm. Chaya. Yeah, no, I, so my opinion is I don't think kids have to see everything. I, I think that they, kids pick up if there's a comfort yes. in the marriage, if there's a love in the marriage, if there's um, a respect in the marriage. And more than that, I feel it, they will learn at the right time. So that's, that's my opinion. Yeah. yeah. But, but again, like, like, you know, it's, it's really, very it's personal. personal. It's yeah. very, very personal and how you feel that you have to portray this over. And again, it's a conversation to have with your spouse and how comfortable they feel and what they, their thoughts are. And that's like, again, everything goes hand in hand and right back to that. For me, at least everything goes right back to those conversations. Mm -hmm. So here we have another practical one. What do you do when your kid comes and says, mommy, where do babies come from? At what age can you tell them? You have a lot of children, my dear. You go for it. <laughs> Interesting. So I was blessed that my last child was was by a C-section. So I, I could, you know. <laughs> you really think about it this right, time. Right, right. <laughs> um, so it's interesting. I, I speak to my children that Hashem made a special wave that, you know, how childbirth is done. It's very special and it's a real miracle, every child. Um, they sometimes look at me like a little puzzled. Again, it's if, if they're old, it depends how old we're talking, you know, we're talking about. But um, I think it's very important to answer the question. It's very important not to brush off a question and ignore the question. Um, but I usually say something to that, to that effect. Usually they're very young when they ask that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when they're older, they, they don't ask those questions. So when they're young children, we're talking about preschool age or maybe kindergarten, first, second grade, um, I tell them that Hashem has a special way um, of, you know, it's a gift that Hashem gives to us. I mean, I'm not going to go into every detail that I tell my children, but I, I do, don't go in, when they're very young, I don't go into the whole anatomy of the whole childbirth. When they're older, I We'll have, yeah. have discussions with them about that. I think sometimes also you have to ask what they're really asking. Like when we were right. little, it was, it was like, was it a car or the storch? You know, like in Baltimore, they would put like storches on the front, cardboard storches on the front of everyone's lawn when they had a baby. So like, how did it, how did it come? <laughs> we thought it literally got carried. You know, so sometimes asking the question and understanding that they're really just asking, did you come home in a taxi or did daddy pick you up? You know, sometimes it's, it's much simpler than we think it, it, it is. That's little. true too. That's really true too. That's <laughs> very helpful. Um, okay, here's another question, sort of more um, global. Uh, how do you balance having the open conversations about Taras Mishbacha and notions of, of mm -hmm. Tznias and privacy? Are you telling your teens or tweens not to talk about those topics with their friends? 110%. That's me, at least. Mm -hmm. um, I tell them that this is so beautiful, but totally private. Mm -hmm. Now, are they going to have these conversations? Sometimes they, are, they do, and that's okay, because you just say, come talk to me about it. Um, you keep that conversation open, but I can tell you that when you tell your children and when you have an open relationship and a very close relationship and you explain to them why it's not just like, don't tell them you're going to get in trouble. They're not going to listen. But if you have conversations about this is really special and this is really private and this is really between you right now and your parents. And one day it's going to be between you and your spouse. And that's it. That's all that's going to know about it. And then I feel it eventually. But that's all that's going to know about it. It's like this private, secret, like amazing, incredible thing. Do you really want to keep that private? And if you talk to them about it, then really when the conversations come up with friends, I might say, by the way, mom, like this conversation, you know, I didn't partake in it. That does happen in my house. Um, but you explain to it. Again, conversations are the main key and validation and respect with your teenager mm -hmm. um, and understanding where they're coming from and what's going on with them. Yes, I, I agree with that. Okay, so um, we have two questions left. Um, the, the first question, uh, the, the question asks, the questioner asks, Alana talk, Alana's talk stresses that are uh, about the importance of our girls feeling beautiful inside and out. How do you feel about teen girls mm. wearing makeup to feel beautiful? Do you have an answer for this one? This is rough for me. 
So it, it's interesting. Like I find like everything in moderation. So like uh, an example, when I, we had this wedding last week, my brother-in-law's wedding and um, my daughter who's in 10th grade really wanted to get her makeup done. And I thought for a moment, I said, sure. Like that was a good opportunity yeah. for her to feel special. No, I don't want her wearing makeup every day, you know, but, and, and I think when I said yes, very quickly, she felt really good about mm -hmm. it. And like, and I, and she, I think I filled her, oh, okay, this is what it's all about. And then when she gets older, I want her to wear makeup. Absolutely. But I think if not, we shouldn't always say no to our children because yes. then they're going to want things more. So it's that, it's that balance. Right. It's really that balance. I think also like wearing makeup, like I, I wear makeup with color Chavez. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um and I think talking to our daughters about why are we in makeup why do we not feel beautiful mm -hmm. I think it's I don't really... think it means that you don't feel beautiful though so I feel a lot of kids tell me I actually just had this conversation with a kid today mm -hmm. in my class and I said to her sweetie she's like I have to go to the bathroom right now I said okay she's like I have to put on my makeup I'm like okay you're a little pusher and like for who like I didn't say this to her obviously this is what's going through mm -hmm. my head don't worry I didn't say it but I'm like why she's like what are you talking about? I, I'm not beautiful. I need to make up. And this is a little like kid, you know? Yeah. And I think these conversations, again, being involved in middle school and high school, things pop out of kids' mouths that they don't always realize they pop out. Mm -hmm. But having these conversations, especially when they're in middle school and early high school and saying like, why do you, why do you feel that? You're really beautiful. Let's go stand in the mirror and look together. Like, let's look at how beautiful you are. And finding ways, again, you want to wear a little bit of makeup, but drop a mascara first a couple of chavas. It's not because you're not beautiful, right? We right. have to tell our girls that they're beautiful. Um, and that's how I feel. Obviously, every person, what I'm saying is that every person needs to have these conversations with their children as appropriately and figure these things out with their kids. Validation is super important. The changing of the relationship, um, understanding where they're coming from, understanding what they're feeling is all part of this conversation. But keeping this as an open conversation and making decisions with your daughters um, and sons um, based on what um, they're experiencing in the moment and why they're experiencing that is really important. But I do feel strongly like kids wearing makeup, my own kids wearing makeup in high school and middle school really can be detrimental for a long time. That's just my, again, weddings, oh my gosh, go for it, be crazy. Be a little nuts. Put glitter on your face. I had, I had, I had an aunt. All over. <laughs> who, after our graduation, our high school graduation, it was like the thing in our family, she would take us to get makeup, like after we graduated 12th grade. And like, I thought it was like this really special tradition that, that we had. So it, I think at the right time in every family time. is different. Yeah. Okay, so our last question is a very practical one. Um, how do you manage preparing when you're preparing for the mikvah when your house is full of teens or kids in general who are suspicious of your prep? For example, they wonder why why is mommy taking a bath? Um, first of all, um, why do they have to know what right. you're doing in your bathroom? Like they don't have to. I mean, locked. yeah. So like, <laughs> I go to my room sometimes. I, <laughs> sometimes I tell my kids like. I'm here, but I'm not here for the next two hours. Time out. Like I'm saying whatever I'm doing in my room. And, and it, I think you know, we don't have to tell our children what we're doing every moment of the day, I, I think. Yeah, I don't, I agree. I, like I said before, that, that self-care situation, when I talk to my kids about, it's really important that I have time for, for daddy right? Obviously. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for me to have time for you, right? We can sit and we can walk and we can talk and we can make coffee and milkshakes and dinner together. Um, and it's also really important for me to have time for myself. And I don't have to go into detail what that looks like. If my bath is running, okay. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. I think it's important. Those boundaries really make our lives much easier. Great. Well, and that was our last question. So with that, uh, we're going to once again thank our amazing panelists and moderator. And I'm going to um, send it over to Renee for some closing remarks. Sure. All right. Our next event will be a talk about menopause on Tuesday, November 8th on Zoom. So look out for the details for that event. The recording of tonight's event will be available within a few days on our website, mikvahamuna.com. If you have any comments, feel free to email us at comments at mikvahamuna.com. Please fill out the survey again if you haven't already. Laura, Chaya, and Alana, thank you for this wonderful talk. And thank you all for coming and good night. Thanks, everyone.